Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Brother Yahya, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Thank you, Brother Yahya, for the very kind words. Maybe I'd like to start by saying how I ended up in here. When Brother Yahya sent me the facts inviting me here, I of course had to get the permission of my boss, the Prime Minister. So at the corner of the of that that piece of invitation, I wrote there, "Dear Prime Minister, can you please approve me to come to LA for this conference?" And of course, I gave I went to see him and gave him the the invitation. Of course, he didn't look at what I wrote. He looked at this conference and he saw Dr. Yahya's name and all that. And he looked at me and said, "No," he said. Do you think I should I should accept this invitation? <laughs> <laughs> then I realized I was in trouble. So I said, "Sir, this is not for you. This is for me." I said, "Okay, okay. If you want to go, you can go." So that shows that uh, as far as the Prime Minister of Malaysia is concerned, all Doctor Yahya has to do is to ask, and he will come. But he didn't ask the Prime Minister this time. He asked me. So thank you, Brother Yahya, for asking me, and not the Prime Minister. <laughs> So this, this uh, in the next few minutes, I just like to briefly uh, touch on a topic which is very close to the Prime Minister's heart, which is the poverty among uh, the nations, particularly among the Ummah. As we know, uh, half the human population live on less than two U.S. dollars per day. In fact, half of Sub-Saharan Africa, 600 million people live on less than U.S. 65 cents a day. And in the case of the Muslim Ummah, out of the 1.3 million Muslims, 70% live in the lowest income countries, virtual poverty. 70% of Muslims live in virtual poverty. Out of the, out, and, and in the case of the rich countries, there are only four countries that can be considered rich. Uh, in terms of the definition of a per capita nominal income of 9,266 per head. And only half of 1%, not even 1%, half of 1% of the Muslim Ummah live in these four rich countries. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, poverty is a very basic uh, hindrance, a very basic handicap for the Ummah. And our view basically, and the view of the Prime Minister is, and he's pushing it at every uh, conference, at every opportunity that he can, is that to get, to, to, to get the, the, the 64 very, very poor countries out of this trap of poverty, out of this cycle, vicious cycle of poverty, the basic ingredient is infrastructure. Which I think makes sense, because without infrastructure, no matter what we do, no matter what we do in terms of training, in terms of debt relief, in terms of food uh, charity, they cannot get out of poverty, except if you have the infrastructure. So the, 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 the view is that this infrastructure must be built, and it must be built by way of uh, assistance uh, from the rich countries, possible by way of tax. And this infrastructure must be built directly by a UN agency in the country concerned, and it should not go to the normal bureaucracy of the countries involved. Otherwise, the elite of the country may, may siphon out the funds elsewhere. The question arises, of course, uh, why should the rich pay? Why should the rich countries pay uh, for this project? We have the view that it's logical and right for those who make a good living in a country through business, for example, to pay tax on the income. For example, in Malaysia, the rich pay tax uh, on a sliding scale and infrastructure is built and the rich use the infrastructure, the poor also are able to use the infrastructure. So what happens in a country should also happen in a community of nations where we have poor countries and rich countries. Uh, it is only logical for the rich countries to, 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 to pay for, for, for the benefit of these poor countries. In any case, by building the infrastructure in the poor countries, our view is that the rich countries will also benefit. The building of infrastructure projects in the poor countries will provide a direct benefit to many of the, many of the rich countries, since only they are capable of providing technology, the sophisticated machinery, 
and the engineering skills required for big infrastructure projects. In some of the rich countries, the boom in infrastructure building is already over. The infrastructure development phase has matured. However, on the basis of this proposal that the rich countries are taxed and uh, the money is used to build infrastructure in the poor countries, the rich countries will be able to facilitate the longevity of their own engineering and infrastructure companies by sending them abroad. Even the rich countries where construction continues to be an important domestic activity will benefit. This is because given that the construction sector is cyclical in nature and painful, with painful downturns, the existence of opportunities for infrastructure development in poor countries would help to smoothen the cycle, since excess capacity can be sent abroad, abroad while the domestic construction industry awaits the next upcycle in the domestic demand. A very poor country would surely be a poor market for the products of the rich countries. By contributing to the building of infrastructure in the poor countries, the rich nations will be securing potential new markets for their products. Infrastructure by itself builds up new demand for new goods. Better electricity, for example, creates demand for more television sets, washing machines and fridges. New roads creates demand for more cars, more for motorbikes. A cellular phone network will create an immediate demand for cellular phones. These goods will be supplied by the rich countries. The rich countries, by agreeing to this proposal, namely to finance infrastructure in the poor countries, will be contributing directly to the efforts to eliminate poverty in the world and thereby remove a, a substantial burden on the world community. As we all know, nature abhors a vacuum. The widening of the wealth gap between countries is bound to create friction and tension. By distributing some of its wealth, the rich world will assist in releasing some steam from the pressure of the wealth imbalance. Ladies and gentlemen, poverty breeds illness and plagues. This may rapidly spread to the rich countries themselves. Improving the standards of living of the poor nation improves the health levels of rich nations too, since it reduces the chances of epidemics that can spread worldwide. But why infrastructure? Infrastructure is a basic requirement for any economy and it provides the fastest gains. No trade or manufacturing activities can be carried out without first addressing the infrastructure issue. Once infrastructure is in place, all sorts of economic activities can be spurred on. Wherever a road or a rail track is built, towns spring up. Local producers will not only find a market in the new towns, but will be able to market their produce in faraway places, including in foreign countries. Infrastructure by itself is a social good and benefits a very broad range of the population of any country. Many poor nations cannot afford infrastructure costs which are high and lumpy although they may be able to support the normal maintenance budget. Given that the poor nations need the infrastructure to get out of poverty, but at the same time cannot afford the infrastructure project, this proposal to finance infrastructure by the rich countries makes a great deal of sense. When we speak of poor countries, we refer to the 64 countries in the lowest income category with a nominal GDP per capita of US dollars 755 or less. These are the countries where we want to concentrate. Now, how is the tax to be collected? The, the proposal, in the PM's proposal, the tax will be collected from the rich countries for a period of 20 years only. Because to ask anybody to pay in perpetuity, nobody will want to pay. So it's limited by time. And uh, instead of creating a new infrastructure to administer it, which will create more costs, uh, the suggestion is that UNDP, which is an institution under UN, will, will administer the scheme. Basically, the projects that should be chosen for this uh, uh, project, the multiplier and linkage effects must be maximized. And we are talking about hard infrastructure. We, 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 the idea is to build the hard infrastructure, the roads, the railways, the bridges, the dams, the pipelines, the power plants. Because some people may say that what about the soft infrastructure, education and others. For them, I think it's, it's quite easy to get the funding uh, from other sources. 
the, the, the funds will be disbursed on a progress payment basis and will be disbursed direct to the, the, to the project. It's very important that in this proposal to build the infrastructure projects in the poor countries, there is no consideration for ideological factors. In other words, we should not relate this to human rights abuses, etc. We just take the 64 countries and build them some of these infrastructure projects so that at least they will move up uh, uh, to, a, uh, 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 to a level which is close to a takeoff level. So the, 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 it, to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, the view is that the most important factor to, 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 for, for the 64 very poor countries to get out of poverty, to, uh, to get out of this cycle of poverty, this vicious cycle of poverty, is basically the requirement for infrastructure. And it is a responsibility, moral responsibility of the rich nations to help them to, to build this infrastructure. Thank you very much.